Welcome to my talk, What is an ABI and Why is Breaking It a Problem? My name is Marshall Clow. I'm a longtime uh, Boost author. I'm the author of the Boost uh, Algorithms Library. I've been a member of Boost since oh, about 2001. Um, this is the first Boost Con slash C++ now that I've not been present in person to. Of course, nobody's present in person. Um, I uh, just finished up a year ago. I finished up a five-year term as the library working group chair of the C++ standards committee, and for a long time, I was the lead engineer on the C++. Um, so I I know a little bit about libraries, about setting up libraries and using libraries and developing libraries. At least I like to think so. Anyway, um, if you have questions, please throw them in the Q and A section and I will answer them as I see them or when I think it's appropriate to answer them or at the end, one of the three. Um, okay, let's get started. What is an ABI? Why is breaking it a problem? Hello? Just a second, there we go. All right. Before we get started on this, you know, we're, as, as I said in the course description, the track description, we're going to do a little bit of history. We're going to make a long detour into the idea of a one definition rule and then tie it all up with some, um, with come back to the idea of what an ABI break is and then, um, and then some possible, you know, some, some ideas on how to deal with this, basically. So, in, over the, the last, say, decade or so, there have been many proposals, many several proposals, uh, to the Standards Committee to make changes to the Standard Library that have been uh, dismissed by various people, dismissed by the committee in general, but usually not by the committee in general, but by various subgroups, using the, uh, the shorthand phrase, this is, that's an ABI break, and I want to talk about what that means today. Um, also, in the last face-to-face -face meeting, 2020 in Prague, Titus Winter presented a paper arguing that it was time to make changes to some of the classes in the standard library in an incompatible way. Um, the title of the paper was ABI Now or Never. It's numbers P1863. Um, and uh, there's a companion paper as well that describes some of the changes that uh, Titus wants to make. Um, none of them are huge, but they are all, you know, for some use cases, a significant improvement. Um, and at that meeting, Titus asked the committee to commit to breaking the standard library ABI in some future release of the standard. Um, this did not happen. Um, the committee just declined to do that. And, um, there's been a lot of discussion on various places since then. Um, a lot of hyperbole, I thought. Uh, one post got my attention. It was titled, The Day the Standard Library Died. Um, there's been a bunch of discussion about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. And so I'm going to talk about some of that today. Um, OK. So let's start with, what is an ABI? ABI stands for Application Binary Interface, and it deals with the interfacing of C++ code to, the, to a particular platform. Um, things like structure layout and vtable layout and pass it, parameter passing, and name angling, and exception handling methods. The, the, um, basically, what the standard does, it describes how things are supposed to work, not how they are implemented. Um, name mangling the the compiler doesn't actually, the standard doesn't really talk about it at all. Um, but it's up to the tools vendors, or the platform vendor as the case may be, to make sure that they, this all work. And basically mangling the, the names of functions and types so that you can distinguish between functions with the same name but different parameter lists is the solution that most everybody has settled upon. Um, Anyway, most of these things are defined by the, um, the platform or the um, compiler. 
And so, um, really, the, um, the standard doesn't have a lot to say about this. Um, if you search for C++ ABI break and kind of look around, you will see, among other things, a, uh, a page, a GCC page, which lists all the times that GCC has changed their ABI. And almost all of them were, in fact, name-mangling changes. Um, apparently, the, there was a lot of discussion about how to mangle uh, no pointer, no pointer T, and so on. And most of the changes were that very well. Fix a bug in mangling, the mangling of things that took no pointer, and fix the mangling of no pointer, and so on like that. Um, but in this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking changes to library code and how they affect IBA, not ABI, not compiler changes. Um, and from a strict point of view, in terms of accuracy, you know, accuracy, these are these are not. This is not really an ABI change. But that's the term that people are using, so I'm going to stick with it. So when I talk about the ABI of a piece of code, I mean things like structure layout, parameter passing, size of things, and so on. And the reason I'm limiting this to library changes is because that's really what people are talking about in Prague and afterwards. Okay. But first, first we need to talk about the one definition rule. Uh, what is the one definition rule? This, the C++ standard actually talks about the one definition rule. And I'm going to paraphrase it here. There's lots of, lots of little corner cases and so on, but the basic thing is it says if there's one, more than one definition of an entity visible in the program that, aren't, that isn't the same, then the behavior of that program is undefined. Okay, so if you have, um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically what it is. And there's there's phrases like ODR used and a whole bunch of details about it, but broadly that's what it says. Um, so I have some examples. But first, actually, I got I got a little ahead of myself. First, let's talk about um, what the standard says. The standard basically says that. A program that violates the undefinition rule, which I'm going to say ODR for now, um, that violates, violates the one definition rule is, quote, ill form, no diagnostic required, which may be, in fact, the worst acronym ever in the history of C++, which is saying something. Uh, people don't even try to make a word out of it. You just hear people just say IFNDR. And that's what it means. Ill form, no diagnostic required. And what does this mean? This means that your tool chain is allowed to produce a program that can do anything and but with no warnings, not actually tell you that it's done so. It's okay if you have an ODR violation somewhere in your program, it is um, just fine for your for your tool chain to spit out an executable that does something. It's basically, it's very much like undefined behavior, except that um, usually undefined behavior is uh, limited to a particular operation or a particular part of your program. And in this case, it's no, the whole program. Um, this is, this is really, really an awful state to be in. This is a horrible state of affairs. I don't think anybody's going to argue about that. And later, in, later, I will t explain to you why, how we got there, why, why things are this way, and why there's a, it's really hard to fix. Okay, so let's do some examples. Okay, examples of ODR violations. Um, gonna, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use structs because they're easy. And because it's uh, it's nice and short, it fits on a slide. So let's take a look here. In header one, we have a struct called foo. It contains two fields, A and B. This, this is fine. Um, 
In Hair 2, we have a struct called Foo, but it has three fields, A and B, and in the middle there we have added. Okay, um, what happens here? What's the problem here? The, uh, an interesting answer is maybe nothing. Okay, if, if as they say, never the twain shall meet, if, you know, foo is, foo is completely com um, encapsulated inside people who use header one and completely encapsulated inside people who use header two, or it's not even a header file, it's just a, a local structure definition in a, in a CPP file. This is not a problem. There's not um, anywhere that both of them are visible. And so life is good. Um, but once you start sharing them, people code that includes header one, not file one, I consider in my slides, header one, believes that foo is a uh, is an eight byte structure and uh, code that includes header two include in, uh, believes that foo is a 12 byte structure. And again, offset B is either offset four or offset eight. Remember that C++ is not Python. You don't actually look up the name of the field at runtime to see where it is in the struct, but instead you just you just have, you say it's an offset from the start of the struct. Um, if things get, if this were to get passed between code that believes in the other definition, bad things could happen, okay? Um, consider that you say you allocate, you have an array of these, okay? And you pass a pointer to the beginning of the array to something else. Or if you prefer, you want, this is C++, so let's have a vector, right? And you want to process all the things in the vector. Um, one chunk of code will believe, you can go stepping through um, these things at, six bytes at a time, I'm sorry, 12 bytes at a time, and other, the other chunk of code might expect things to be eight bytes apart, and pretty soon you'll get off, you'll get out of kilter and you start reading thing, right, reading, you know, other fields in the next foo instead of the one you think you have, and basically, yeah. Um, you just, if you're lucky, if you're very lucky, you will get wrong answers. If you're unlucky, you will read off the end of some structure or read on initialized memory or hit a, hit a memory page boundary and your program will crash. You know, depends on what you consider lucky. I, mean, I, I tend to think of undefined behavior. The luckiest thing that could happen is your program crashes because then you know you have a problem. Um, this difference in, it affects any class that inherits from foo or has member variables of type foo as well. Um, so it's not just naked foos, it's things that inherit from food. Um, one version of this that people have seen in the past uh, that actually became famous back when we built lots of deep inheritance hierarchies was called the uh, fragile base class problem. And basically it meant that if you change something high up in your inheritance hierarchy, Everything farther down in the inheritance hierarchy had to change, had to be rebuilt. If you added a struct to your class object, say, as people would want to do in the 90s, have a class called object or I object or something like that. If you had to add a class to the, a, a, a member to that, everything that inherited from object, either directly or indirectly, had to be recompiled because otherwise it wouldn't know about this and its sizes would be wrong. And that's a great example of the ODR violation. The inherited class foo that inherits from object thinks an object is four bytes long when intact it's eight bytes long. And so, yeah, bad things are happening. Okay, onward. Another example. Okay, variations on a theme, I should say. Okay. Variations on a thing. Um, just like adding a member, add, adding a member, excuse me, causes these problems. Removing a member variable, same problem, okay? Exact same problem. Um, the, the only thing is different is the particulars. You remove a member, your structure gets smaller. 
same fragile base class problems, same problem with members of or inheriting from. Um, you need to, everything needs to be recompiled so you only have one, um, one source of truth, I guess, is the best way to put it. When you have two different definitions, yeah, you, you get ODR violations. Uh, one that people don't think so much about is pragma path. Um, most compilers have something like this, a pragma that says pack things as tight as they can or pack things to two-byte alignments or four-byte alignments or eight-byte alignments or one-byte alignment or whatever. Um, obviously, this changes structure layout. It changes where, where fields start. It doesn't change the size of fields, of member variables, but it changes their offsets from the beginning of the structure, and so can change the size of the overall structure. Um, this is a this is a rather insidious way to get ODR violations where you have a header file that says pragma pack one in it, and then includes another header file that defines a structure. And so sometimes this structure is is packed tightly together, and sometimes it isn't. That's a really ugly one to find because you look and the, there's only one definition, but there's a pragma somewhere that sometimes changes the um, the meaning of it. Okay. Second example: virtual functions. Here we have a virtual function, a a structure that has two vir virtual functions, one name one and a destructor, and somewhere else we have one and two. That uh, and the destructor. So let's think back about how virtual functions are implemented. Okay, um, every every type that has a virtual um, function, actually, I should say, every object that has a that is a, a type that has a virtual functions has a static member variable that points to a table of function pointers, and in there are all the um, the virtual functions. And so when the time comes to call one, say, it at, grabs that, that function po that pointer to the v table, the function virtual table, goes to an offset in that table, there's an address of one, and calls through that. So what happens if one chunk of code builds a V table that looks like this, and another one does that looks like this. Um, you could call the wrong function, the wrong virtual function. That would be really bad. Um, if you're expecting a V table with three entries and you get one with two and you try to call the last one, you could try to call a random address off the end of the table. Hopefully that would crash pretty quickly. Um, for those of you who are thinking of, well, I can game this, I have a question for you. How are entries ordered in the table? You can search the, uh, the standard. It has nothing to say about that. It doesn't even say anything really about vtables. Um, are they alphabetical? Are they reverse alphabetical? Are the order they they are declared in the source file? Are they the order they're defined in the source file? Are they reversed of the order of the they are declared defined in the source file? Um, every compiler has a way of doing it, okay? And they almost certainly document it because it's nice when compilers can play well together. I can tell you that for GCC and Clang, for example, they are um, done in the order that they are declared. But there's nothing that says that that's set in stone. It just, that's the way they do it. That's an implementation choice. Um, okay, more. I just said all that. All right, this one's a little more subtle, okay? We have pair. This 
kind of looks like STD pair and looks like this on purpose because I took this example from STD pair. Okay, we have two, two uh, member variables called first and second, and we have a, con a copy constructor that takes a constant pair. That, it, that all it does is it copies the first one and copies the second one. So it's a pairwise, uh, it's a memberwise copy. Okay, this is completely unsurprising. This is what you want it to do. Okay, but suppose you say to yourself, self, that's just what the compiler will do for me if I just say equals default. Okay, and so you change this to say equals default. And in fact, this is what the C++ standard committee did in C++, I forget, 11 or 14. Uh, when pair was originally defined in C++03, it, um, we did not have equals default, so pair was defined to do memberwise copying. But in, but in one of these, C++11 or 14, I don't remember which, um, this was changed to say equals default. Great. You know what? That's easy to, easy to understand. It's easier to write. Um, the compiler does a, the right thing. Guess what? Um, this pair is a struct. The default copy constructor does memorize construction. What we were doing before. It even generates the exact same code. This is great. However, however, this is a behavior change, and it turned out to be an ABI change. Okay, and the reason it's an ABI change is because with this change, some specializations of pair can be now trivially copyable. They never could be before because Pair had a user-defined constructor. Now it does not. And so now things can be trivially copied, pairs can be trivially copyable if the copy constructor of both types, A and B, T1 and T2, excuse me, are both trivially copyable. Why does that matter? Well, because on some platforms, the way the ABI is defined, parameters of trivially copyable types that can fit into a register are passed into a register instead of on the stack. Ouch. So what would happen here if you had a pair, say, short, 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 care, whatever, care, 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 short, something like that, to a pair of two things of trivially copyable type that when put together will fit into a register, and you try to pass it to some chunk of code um, on these platforms, the compiler will put it in a register instead of on stack. And if at the other end, if the receiving function the function you're calling expects it on the stack instead of in a register. Well, we'll just say that, you know, you won't get the answer you expect. How's that? Uh, this is, this is right. This is a nasty, um, hard to diagnose bug because it's not actually, you know, you're, you can look, stare at this all day, but without a lot of uh, knowledge that, most people don't have and most people don't need, um, you, will, you will have a hard time finding this. And one of the things that people like to do along the way is, ha, 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 well, I'll just do a, a full recompile of my code because, you know, I don't know what else to do. And holy heck, the problem goes away because the, the receiving code, the code that expected it in a, uh, in, on the stack has now been updated and it expects it in a register. Yay. But there's no understanding there as to why it's going on. Um, 
that's not a, really an option for your standard library vendors. Um, for a while, libstud C++ just didn't actually make this change because it would break users' code. Lib C++ made a, did a slightly different thing, but it, it basically did some trickery to ensure that no matter what, specializations of pair would not be trivially copyable. Um, I believe it inherited from an empty base class with a user-defined empty copy constructor. Okay? Still the same code. The same code gets generated, but it is no longer trivially copyable, and so it never gets passed in a register. Um, so we, um, we have a question from Ray Fix. Hello, Ray. And the question is, has standardizing ABI ever been considered, like standardizing a virtual table, uh, virtual table order among compiler vendors? Um, no, not that I know of, um, because I don't see, I don't believe there's any benefit to it. Um, existing compilers have their own order, and um, nobody. Um, if if such a thing was standardized. Somebody would have to change, which would mean it, they would basically be breaking this for all of their users. And that seems like a big, big hit for what gain? Saying, oh yeah, this is there. We're the same with these other compiler that you never actually linked to. Um, Clang, when Clang was brand spanking new, one of their um, design goals was to interoperate with GCC, and so basically they generated virtual table order in the same order that GCC did. They chose to do it that way for that particular reason. But that was, you know, since Clang at the time had no installed base of code, that was not a problem. You know, when you're making talking about changes like that, you want to think about what is the benefit. What is the cost? If, you know, let's just say that, oh, let's pick on XLC, IBM's compiler. If IBM's compiler decided that they were going to change their virtual table order to match um, clients, that would be a, an awful lot of, of stum and drong for people who use XLC, because basically they would have to recompile everything that every binary they have. Anyway, we'll get to things like that in a little bit. Um, okay. So, question is, why can't the compiler generate content? Why can't the compiler actually diagnose this? This IFNDR thing is scary. It is really scary. Okay, it says, you know, I'm going to produce a an invalid program and not tell you. That is that is exactly not what you want. So let's talk about this. So three different cases. We have the first case, right? The first case is we have two different different definitions in the same translation unit. Okay, the single run of the compiler. The compiler can generate diagnose this, and in fact, most compilers do. Okay, they'll say, ah, oh, redefinition of struct foo not allowed, or something like that. Okay, second case. Two different definitions, excuse me, definitions in different translation units. And they're statically linked together. Okay, theoretically, theoretically the linker can in fact diagnose this. Um, in practice, they don't. In practice, there's not enough information in the object file for the linker to diagnose this. It would be really, you know, we could upgrade our compilers to emit more stuff in object files, making object files bigger, and up upgrade linkers to actually um, find this, but they don't. Okay? Um, third case. 
two different definitions in different translation units. And I should say, shouldn't say two, I should say multiple different definitions in different translation units, and they're dynamically linked. In the third case, your tool chain is not involved at all. Okay, it's the program loader on your OS that assembles the program. Uh, your program loader, your OS's program loader, whether it be Linux or Mac OS or Android or Linux or Windows or iOS or whatever, doesn't know diddly about C++. It knows about object files. It knows about dynamic libraries. It knows how to, um, how to hook things up, and that's about it. And so, you know, saying, can the compiler diagnose this? No, the compiler can't diagnose this at all. In fact, frequently, um, what happens is that the compiler that compiled these different things that are assembled at runtime were on different machines. They might have been different compilers even. And so they have no knowledge of each other. And so that's where the IFNDR comes from, no diagnostic required, because the program is really not just an executable, but it's, a, it's the union of an executable and all the dynamic libraries that the executable uses transitively. So if, if, you're, if your executable uses a dynamic library, which uses another dynamic library, it's, it's the union of all of those. And that is why it's hard. That's, that's why diagnosing this is hard. Okay. Next. So we've talked about ODR violations for a while. Let's talk about, go back to the title of this talk, which was about ABI breaks, except I said they're really API breaks, but we're gonna call them ABI breaks. How do you get from an ODR violation to an ABI break? So instead of two different files, think of two different versions of the same file. Okay? You install a new version of a shared library you use and it comes with an updated header file with a different declaration for some struct and you don't rebuild your code to incorporate that change. Or you install, you install a different um, a different a system update comes with an updated shared library. Or the other half of that is suppose you update your compiler and it comes with a new set of header files. Does that include a new shared library for the standard library? Probably not. Um, anyway, really what this is, is, is this an ODR violation between the environment in which the program is built and the environment in which the program is run. Um, that pair change that I mentioned above was a great example of that. It was a, the, the uh, environment where the program was built was, you know, compiling with say C++03 and the, and the environment where the shared library was built was compiling with C++11 say, or vice versa. And yeah, you get different, you get different results and things do not work well together. So we come to the, the pithy way of saying this. For the purposes of this talk, an ABI break is just an ODR violation in time. You think about that, the time. It wasn't an ODR violation until you installed a new shared library. I am inordinately fond of this phrase, even though it's not really accurate. I think it encapsulates things, uh, what, I, what we're talking about here. But anyway, so how can we deal with this? How can we avoid this? Um, hoof and mouth disease, right? How do, you, how do you don't have hoof and mouth disease? Well, if there are no horses that uh, have hoof and mouth disease, there won't be any horses that have hoof and mouth disease. If you don't change things that affect the ABI, you won't ever have any ABI changes, right? That's pretty simple. 
Um, unfortunately, that's hard. When you make a change to some source file, you know, some header file, does it affect the ABI? Does it? Um, that's, that's a tough question to ask. Tough question to answer, I should say. Um, don't have stale binaries, otherwise known as rebuild everything every time from scratch. And there are people who do this. Um, <clears throat> large search engine companies um, have no interest, a particular large search engine company has no interest in, has no concerns about ABI breaks, I should say, because every build is completely from scratch. All the things they use get built from scratch, or so I'm told. Um, and so if, you know, if they make a change which changes the ABI, that's fine because everything, they only have one definition of everything. But that only works if you have sources for everything and you rebuild everything every single time. For most people, that is not an option. Okay. Do you rebuild your standard library dialib and all the other C++ dialibs you have on your system on a regular basis? Very few people do that. Um, right. I have a comment here that says, um, when you upgrade your compiler, you get new header files, but usually not a new dialib. Is that an IBA, ABI break? Yeah, maybe. But here, you know, standard library implementers and tool vendors try really hard to make it not be one. Um, really, really hard because these things come back and bite them. Um, have only one definition for everything is a goal. It's an aspiration more than an actual thing that you can do because unless you're building everything from scratch yourself, um, you don't have all the bits needed for everything. You know, where were your shared libraries built? Probably on another machine. Um, one definition for everything, this applies to object files you link, to, link against, it applies to shared libraries, it applies to everything. Um, and so this is what makes it hard. Okay. Do we have any examples of ABI breaks in the wild? We absolutely do. I, I have two of them here. Okay. First one, C++ 17 committee change in place back to return a reference to the newly in placed object instead of void. Um, basically, somebody noticed that when you call in place back to, to create an object in a container, a very common thing immediately afterwards is to call back to get a, uh, get a reference to this newly created, ob newly created object in the container because they want to do something with it. So the art, that was the argument, and the, um, the idea was that you make it um, make in place back return that reference instead of void. Makes all kinds of sense. Um, it is an ABI break because you've changed the return type of the function, but you've returned it from you've changed it from void returning nothing to returning a reference. And so existing code that expected nothing. Well, got a reference that they didn't do anything with it, and everything was okay. This for, this change did not actually cause any problems that um, that I am aware of. Okay, another one. Okay, in C plus plus seventeen, the uh, standards committee changed um, the requirements on basic string effectively outlawing the copy on write strings that Libstead C++ used pre-C++11. Um, there were good reasons for this. We could have a long discussion about the pros and cons. Um, I see that somebody has commented in the chat. Yeah, stud string copy on write. Yes, here the, and here it is. Um, and Somebody has also asked, does changing the return type not change the mangling? And the answer to that is uh, no, the, the return type is not part of the mangled name. It's an interesting corner case. 
But anyway, yes, copy on write strings, okay? Lipstead says C++ had to change their implementation of basic string, the layout and the behavior both, and hence the ABI of basic string for changes in standard. Um, the, copy on, the old string class implemented copy on write while the new one did not. This was, um, you can go back and read the discussions. There were lots and lots and lots of discussion about this, but basically um, the copy on write strings are have some some big advantages in some use cases and some big disadvantages in other use cases, and they're very hard to be made safe in a multi-threaded environment. And so the committee said, you know, we need these kind of semantics for string. And so fine. the Libstead C++ people said, okay. Um, anyway, what did um, Libstead C++ do? Basically, they implemented the new... Um, the new semantics, the new layout, the new ABI, but they provided a backdoor, a way of um, keeping the old semant, the old implementation around, so that people could keep the old layout behavior for compatibility with old software. Um, this change caused oh a whole lot of pain. Not the fact that there is a backdoor, but the fact that. Uh, you have two different versions of basic string in in Libstead C++, depending on how um, you were compiled, your code was compiled. Um, and this persists to this day. Every now and then, someone pops up on Stack Overflow with a crash that reduce, basically reduces down to two shared libraries exchanging STD strings with different ABIs. Um, the last one of those I saw was just about a year ago, May 2020. Um, when somebody asked as part of a discussion on Reddit about how did Libsyd C++ deal with this, Jonathan Wakeley, who's the lead developer for Libsyd C++, basically said, we invented new compiler magic and we spent a lot of time and energy to ensure that it could be a transition on the user schedule, not just a hard break. The new ABI and the old ABI can exist, coexist in a single process. This was a lot of work for the Lubstead C++ people. Um, it's now been almost a decade. I believe they shipped this in like 2013, so it's been eight years or so. Um, I know of large organizations ha who have not actually made this change over. I know of one in particular people who are here at this conference who are, their plan is to do this in a couple years probably. Um, somebody else who um, works for a large worked for a large aerospace company works for a large aerospace company has successfully transitioned off the old copy on write semantics um, last year in 2020. Um, as part of a upgrading their, their production environment from, I think, Red Hat 6 to Red Hat 8. But in, um, in any case, uh, this, is, this, cha this ABI change to STD string is not a done deal. This, this caused a lot of pain and a lot of um, anguish to a lot of people. And it's still, I mean, we're out in the long tail now, but there's still, there are a lot of people who have not changed. There are a lot of people, there are still people who are, changing or planning to change one of these days, but there are there's still a large mix of stuff out there. Um, somebody commented in chat, I said, I think it hasn't passed a year when, when I haven't uh, encountered this problem. Yes, I mean, if you, if you have a lot of um, software that you have to work with old systems, you have to be really careful not to um, not to mix these. And your tools are really no help at all for you because these things have the same, they mangled the same names. It's really kind of awful. And you know, the only, the only time that you might check is when your program gets assembled by the program loader and that doesn't help you at all. Um, interestingly enough, libc++ has two, okay, three different string implementations, but one of them is a copy and write rep counted string which is only used for exception objects. And that is done because it, we want 
to be compatible with libstud C++ exception objects. So that's not used anywhere really. That's a, that's an internal class. I mean, it's not used. It's not anything public. But libc++ does actually have two different string ABIs as well. Um, and the original behavior of libc++'s string ABIs string um, was a C++ 11 one with the short string optimization and the value semantics, and it was all fine. But then somebody discovered that if you change the layout slightly, you got, um, because of cache alignments um, and common operations, you got a significant performance boost in some large code bases, like mm. browsers, like browsing browser benchmarks, that there was a simple change that, that I think got somebody a 2% increase in browser benchmarks, which was, for, for some people, very much worth it. Anyway, um, so Loop C++ has two different implementations of basic string. And basically what happens is that you, um, your platform vendor picks one. Because Loop C++, if you're using a dilib, um, externally instantiates the basic string code in the dilib to save space in your executables. Um, so Mac OS, for example, Mac OS uses the older, the original uh, basic string layout because Apple has said, yeah, that the, the win for the new one is not worth breaking everybody's code because everybody uses string. When, and on iOS, Apple used the old, the old, the original um, layout for std string or basic string. But when it introduced the 64-bit ARM machines, the 64-bit ARM iPhone and iPad machines, it used that one. It used the newer, the improved layout for basic string on those platforms because there was no installed base to break. And now that Apple has shipping ARM desktop machines, I have not looked, but I assume that they made that change there as well. Again, that's not really an ABI break. That's merely establishing a new ABI. So there, there is a, a great example where you can, you can review all your ABI changes, all your ABI concerns, is when you establish a new platform. Okay, so 64-bit ARM was an example of one. Okay. Do we have an example of a uh, change that was rejected because of an ABI break? Um, not specifically. Um, I'd have to, I dug through my notes and could not find one. I remember discussing them with people. But this is one that came up in the C++ 20 time frame. There was a proposal to add P192 to, um, the proposal was P192, to add a half float type, which is a shorter 16-bit um, floating, point, floating point type. This would be really nice for use in GPUs and SIMDs and SIMD operations and things like this. Um, this was not adopted for C++20. There were several reasons, okay? But one of the reasons was that adding IO stream support to this would involve adding virtual functions to stuff down inside IO streams. And that would basically break um, a lot of code that used IO streams, unless the implementers were very clever and you know, there might be need to be some, you know, compiler hackery going on here to keep things, um, keep things the same. Anyway, um, it never came to a vote, a plenary vote as to why it would be adopted or not. But uh, certainly there was, that was one of the concerns was, um, you're going to break all of IO streams for half float. Um, ouch. That's a uh, that's a big pain for a, 
for a smaller game. Anyway. Okay. So let's now let's wander back into politics. Why is any why is WG21 talking about this? Okay? Um a bit of history, you know, from a theoretical point of view, from a from a you know a strict point of view. WG21 has no reason to poke at this. I mean, the standard doesn't say anything about ABIs, okay? Uh, the standard doesn't say anything about compatibility between different versions of the standard. In fact, the, the C++ ISO and the C++ standard don't even really uh, admit the existence of other versions of the standard. Sure, there's Annex C, but Annex C is... Uh, informative and in committee speak informative means not a requirement merely just you know here's some useful some information you might find useful but not normative or not official not a requirement okay traditionally you love that word traditionally um it has been the implementers who prevented abi breaks either by speaking up in committee when a change should cause an abi break or pointing reporting defects for abi breaks when they're discovered or in some cases just refusing to implement things because they would be abi breaks um the change to pair is an example in lubstead c++ um they may have implemented this by now okay when i looked a few years ago they had not um Implementers are very interested in preventing user pain because they're the ones who get the bug reports. The bug reports, users don't talk to this committee and say, hey, you broke this. They talk to their tool chain vendors or their library vendors or whatever. And the library vendors say, oh, yeah, blame the committee. Well, that's not really a, that's not the answer that uh, people want to actually hear. Okay. However, some members of WG21 um, wish to make changes to things in the standard library. Improvements. Don't get me wrong. Improvements. This is not change for the sake of change. These are improvements. Um, some of them are small changes, like you know, allowing tr pairs of trivial types to get passed into register. Being able to um, pass a unique pointer in a register, um, things like that, and so um, making actually the the big one in terms of you know making large changes, making substantive changes to the unordered containers to um, to improve their performance. There are, <clears throat> there are other alternate implementations of you know unordered map and unordered set that fit under many circumstances, perform much, much better than the ones that are specified in, this, in the C++ standard. Um, anyway, so they started a meta discussion about when ABI breaks are allowed and or desirable. Um, needless to say, this has generated a lot of, of, of heat on both sides. And here's... Basically, this paper lays out the motivation for breaking ABI and gives a, a list of possible changes, improvements that would involve an ABI break. Um, so how could you detect this? I think everybody agrees that, uh, that just changing ABI and doing nothing is um, really just a terrible idea, okay? Because what happens is you, you rebuild your application say, and you run it and it crashes because one of the shared libraries it uses or some static, you know, some object file that you statically link to is using these old definitions. And, ew, that's not a state of affairs we want to be in, okay? There needs, needs to be, at the very least, there needs to be some way of detecting when this were to happen, if, if, you know, if WG21 were to sanction an ABI break, um, there's some way of detecting that this had happened, that you have a mismatch, so that your programs don't just crash. Um, 
One suggestion is that uh, cha to change the name mangling scheme starting on, say, C++26. You know, change the introductory character to Y instead of Z. Um, and basically what this would mean would be that object files built with C++26 would not link with objects files built with previous standard and executables that you'd shared libraries built with that would fail to load. Um, this is sounding an awful lot to me like a different way to get to the Toro's C++ epochs, epochs proposal. Um, good. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, okay. I'm just going to mangle your name and say it's Richard. Richard? I don't know. Anyway, Richard with an accent over his A. The A in his name. Um, say, asks, isn't linking across different compilation flags, including STD, whatever, already a non-defined part of the standard and basically whatever. Um, no, it's not, actually, because it's not defined anywhere in the standard. Um, what, it, um, what it is is that, what it is is great. You'd think I was fluent in English or something. Um, is something that implement, that is implementation defined. And implementers have actually gone to a fair amount of work to make, to make this work, to quote unquote, make this work. Because, um, again, we have object files and shared libraries that are built with other versions of the standard that we wish to have, to have them be interoperable. Um, it's not guaranteed to work. But a lot of people, a lot of people have gone to a lot of effort to make it work in general. And I'm sure there are corner cases where it doesn't work. Hopefully that answers your question. Anyway, um, it's also possible to, for, it would be possible for people to provide quote unquote fat binaries that contain two different versions of the same file, so the same code, you know, one built for C++23 and one built for C++26. Um, could work, you know, and then at link time or load time, your program loader or linker would choose the appropriate one. Um, the details are very are crucial here. How would this actually work? Um, would this mean that all of your binaries or your executables would sometimes suddenly get twice as big, or three times as big, or four times as big? I don't know. It depends. Um, the big problem is, as, as I said earlier, that the program, the system, the executable, if you like, is never actually put together, assembled, until you launch the program. That's when everything is all put together. Um, and at that time, much of the information about types and so on is simply not there anymore. It's been, it's, you know, the compiler generates all this stuff, it generates object code, it writes its object code, and the, compile, and the linker takes that and writes um, it to an executable or a shared library. And all that, inf that information is gone. It is just not around. Um, I want to point out here when I say when all the binaries, shared executable, shared libraries, plugins are all together, um, there are a lot of programs out there in the world that manually have this plugin mechanism where they manually load plugins via, say, DL open. Uh, that kind of stuff is really not statically checkable. Examples of that are browsers, um, graphics programs, audio programs, Acrobat, um, mail programs, uh, the mail program I use on Mac OS, the one that Apple ships, there is a thriving third party plugin um, ecosystem where people write and then sell plugins. 
to manage your mail, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are almost in all shared libraries. Um, some of them are written in C++. Many of them are not. The Photoshop plugins are pretty much all written in C++. And I don't know about other Adobe programs like Lightroom or, or well, all the Adobe programs. Basically, all the Adobe programs are use plugins like up the wazoo. Anyway, that makes it harder. Um, what would this mean to developers? Assuming you had some kind of fat binary packaging scheme that developers ship in binaries would have to choose. Do you want to ship old standards, new standards, both? Um, a lot of this is make file whacking, but there's a real cost here in binary size and testing and build times and so on. And um, certainly not all developers will be willing to sign up for this. Small develop This hits smaller developers harder than bigger developers because they are more constrained on resources. Okay, what does this mean to users? Um, if you have a source to every bit of software you use and you're willing to rebuild it on a regular basis, this is not a problem for you, okay? You can, in fact, um, make whatever changes you want and not worry about ABI changes because you don't have a stable ABI. You just, every time you build, you, you can theoretically have a new ABI. Um, and there are people who do that. Um, yeah, Jason comment said, had to do the fat barrier thing on it for years on macOS. It was a pain, but it worked. Yes. And Jason, are you doing it again for the ARM-based Macs? Uh, just saying, because you know, Apple is, as far as I know, reusing that technology. But anyway. Um, what does this mean to users? You know, you, if you can recompile everything, and I mean everything, then it's just not a problem. If you never use any third-party software, this is not a problem for you either. Your, your OS vendor will resolve any issues. You just you take a distribution from your OS vendor, whether that be Microsoft or Apple or you know whoever is shipping you, Google who's shipping you Android or um, you know some some Linux distribution. Um, not a problem. You don't, you don't have any software of your own, it's not a problem, right? But if you have binaries that use C++ internally, especially if they, um, if they share across boundaries, but if that's not necessarily a requirement, um, then yeah, this would affect you. This, I should say, could affect you, not would affect you. And these are things like, you know, shared libraries that come with your system. Okay, let's say, let's do a user story. Let's do a user story because, you know, why not? It's an agile thing, right? We're all doing agile stuff sometimes. Let's do a user story. Imagine you're a graphic artist and you're a heavy Photoshop user. This is what this is your day job. You are a graphic artist. You get you get paid for everything you produce. Okay, you're you're an independent contractor. You get you get paid on delivery. So you upgrade your system to new OS version, and it comes with a new standard library dialed with a different ABI. And you did a little bit of investigation, that, and Adobe is right on top of this. They have a new version of Photoshop ready to go, which uses a new ABI. So you install that, you install the OS, great. You launch a new version of Photoshop, and what happens? Well, the best of all possible worlds is none of your third-party plugins load. Okay? Maybe they crash on launch. Maybe they corrupt your document. Maybe they crash when you try to use them. Don't know. So now what do you do? You disable all those plugins and okay, now you can't get your work done. So you go and look look and see you have, oh, I have 40 plugins that I use on a regular basis. Um, I checked with Photoshop people, people who do a lot of Photoshop stuff professionally and 40 is a not unreasonable number for having plugins. They tend to do very, very specific things. 
Anyway, so you contact the 15 different developers that you bought these from. And ask, say, I need, need updated versions of these plugins for my work. And some of them will say, yep, okay, here, here's an update. It's ready to go. It's free. And you say, great. And some of them will say, yep, yeah, well, um, some of them will say, oh, yeah, I have an update for that. That'll be X number of dollars. Some will say, yeah, oh, thanks for reminding me. I'll get right on that. And they'll have a new version for you soon, really quick. Others will say, yeah, yeah, one of these days, you know, I'm in grad school and I'm doing this as a sideline thing. And, you know, my thesis defense is next month. So, you know, maybe when I'm done with that. Um, a lot of interesting Photoshop plugins come from math grad students. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Anyway, some of them won't answer their emails. Won't answer their phone. Now you're stuck. Um, plugins are a significant market. Okay, what do you do as your Photoshop user? What do you do? You have to produce stuff or you don't get paid. You restore your system from your backup immediately before you upgraded your OS. You start. You go back to using your old version of Photoshop with your old plugins and your old OS. And you say, yeah, maybe I'll upgrade one of these days when I can do it without losing a lot of functionality in, in impacting my ability to make a living. Um, and that's a sensible response for someone who is you now for someone in this situation. Okay. Plugins are a significant market. Audio plugins, video plugins, graphics plugins, browser plugins, email programs, lots of things. All have ways of adding functionality by incorporating third-party code. Many of these are, in fact, shipped as you know, shared libraries. Um, Richard commented, you know, maybe they'll say this plugin is not compatible with Photoshop version blah 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 blah. That's a great answer, okay? But that's the same as um, not loading, right? Yeah. You know, or your client is too new and this plugin is too old and I won't load them, right? That's that is a that is a best case, right? That's a good thing because it says, ah, oh, this isn't going to work. It's it's going to be bad if I try to use it. But if you're trying to actually get work done, that's a, not a good solution. Anyway, so summing things up, right? There is a real problem here. You know, there's, but people, at the same time, people expect stability. People don't ask for stability, they assume it. Um, the boost. You know, Boost does not promise stability. They explicitly say we don't promise stability from release to release, and yet most Boost libraries actually deliver it. And the ones that don't, they get grief from users when things change. Um, Boost expected, you know, just changed, made a major redesign, a lot of things changed. And Niall announced for two releases that this change was coming, this change was coming. And so I'll be curious to see if this change happened in the uh, release we put up two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So it will be interesting to see um, how this goes. Historically, the standards committee and implementers have prized stability. Um, implementers like stability because if things are unstable, they get a lot of grief from their users. And really, it's it's not just implementers, it's system vendors, okay? System vendors will choose or choose to ship or to not ship breaking changes, okay? Um, we, I'm using in quotes there because it's a very inclusive we, we, people on the committee, implementers, system vendors, users, we would really like a solution that allow us to make changes safely. 
Okay. Other languages like C and Java have dealt with this by making new versions available under new names. Okay. Um, Python 2 to some extent. Python as well, not Python 2 versus Python 3. Um, Python made a change. They just said, you know, at this point, we are incompatible. Go. Um, we don't have a solution to that today. Actually, back up. Historically, the committee has prized stability. Part of that is because the one time a substantive change was made, um, it's still not settled. It's been a decade. Um, right? It's now, we're, we're definitely out in the long tail. Okay, there are, most people have moved on to this, but there are a fair number of people who are still on the other side of the Rubicon, have not actually made this change. They have plans to do it eventually someday, but they are not at the point, at present time. Uh, we don't have a solution today. Um, any solution that we have come up with um, should deal with c closed source software as well. Telling people you just have to rebuild your, your rebuild your software is a non-starter for um, people who don't build their software. Um, my daughter is a geologist. She has a lot of software on her computer. Telling her to rebuild all her software, none of which she wrote, she doesn't even have a compiler installed, is a non-starter. Um, I believe that change the ABI and screw the users is not a solution. Um, also, um, if we were to change the ABI to the standard library, would this be a one-time thing? Or would we want to do it more than once? I got to believe that, that this would be a more than once thing. Um, so any, any, Solution to doing this would should in, should be forward looking enough to say, okay, this is what we'll do this time, and this is what we can do next time, and so on and so forth, so that we um, we don't find ourselves in this situation again where we there are changes we want to make, but we have people are deeming the cost too of changing too high. We'd rather not stay there. Okay. And that is about it.